thank you so much. Um, yes, this is indeed part two of a two-part series introduction to the spiritual path of the PSS Nairobi. I mean, the truth is that one could have uh, obviously many, many sessions um, on his legacy, but uh, we'll begin with two. Um, I will review a little bit of what we did uh, last week for those who are both those who are here, those who are not here, this way it'll be helpful hopefully for both parties. Um, and after a brief review, uh, what I'd like to do is um, uh, uh, enter you into, you know, uh, show, uh, share with you some um, pieces from what's, what's shared on the screen right now, I hope, is coming across to you, which is a piece from the PSS and Rabbi Spinei Machshava Tova, um, an early publication of his, um, and then time allowing, uh, turn to uh, parts of one of his later works, Megoh HaSharim. So, we will, we will get to that. Just in brief review, what we did last week is we, we met, as it were, the PSS and Rebbe. PSS and Rebbe, Rev. Kolonimus, Kalman Shapiro, uh, was a, uh, lived from approximately 1889 to 1943 when he was, when he was uh, murdered um, in the Holocaust. Um, he was the scion of um, an illustrious Polish uh, Hasidic aristocratic lineage. Um, line descended from some of the greats of Polish Hasidism, um, and um, is uh, has been rediscovered of, of as it were in North America and Israel in the last few decades, thirty years already, um, for a few reasons. One, because of his um, uh, his status as a Holocaust theologian, we might term him uh, anachronistically. He was he's also known as the Warsaw Ghetto Rebbe. He wasn't officially the Rebbe. The Warsaw Ghetto, but he was a Rebbe in the Warsaw Ghetto, active um, during those times and leading his flock, teaching, um, theologizing, um, and, and, and leading. And we have uh, records of those, some of his sermons, um, they were called, um, they were collected and uh, entitled uh, posthumously as Ish Kodesh. So he's known for that, uh, for that, uh, that corpus um, and for that uh, part of his legacy. Um, you know, that already has been for the past 30 or maybe more, more years, the Ish Kodesh. Uh, more recently, 10, 20, 25 years, he has been then again rediscovered or claimed as a sort of, um, as a sort of um, um, Hasidic mindfulness expert, if you will. Right? This is a, a person who um, was deeply invested, as we'll see later on, uh, just a few minutes in the life of, of the mind and in uh, meditations and visualizations, in general inner spiritual path, um, and uh, for for that all of that, which you know we'll get to parts of that in a moment, he the 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 what the world has been taken by storm by mindfulness and meditation practices, um, elements of the neo Hasidic world, including the Jewish renewal, but not only world um, um, look to him as a sort of uh, forebearer. Um, during his life, however, he was um, known primarily, I would say, besides as a general Hasidic Rebbe, as an educational figure. Uh, we noted last week that he's been termed by some as Admor uh, HaMechanech, the education, the educating or the educational Rebbe. Um, he had a large yeshiva in Warsaw and wrote extensively on Hasidic education. So he was a very accomplished theoretician and also practitioner. Um, that's a general sense of who he was. We spoke last week as well about the historical milieu in which he operated, um, especially in interbellum, interwar Poland between World War I and World War II. Um, he comes from the small town of, or he he's active in the small town of Piaseczna um, and eventually makes his way to Warsaw, as many Jews did after World War I, as they shifted from more rural to ur urban settings. Um, and um, and it's there that he founds this, this large this large yeshiva. Um, this is a time of great turmoil and crisis, and also of creativity. Many Jews were murdered, uprooted uh, in the course of World War One, in the aftermath of World War One, um, in the shift again to the to urban settings, uh, economic crises. Um, at the same time, along with ideological um, developments, right? So you're in Warsaw at the time when the when the PSS and Rebbe is is writing some of his material, which we'll see later tonight. Um, he is on the same street with um, leading socialist, Zionist, Bundist, Bundist uh, Jewish uh, intellectual figures, uh, 
and it's only in terms of the Jewish uh, population with whom, with whom he is uh, and with whom he's sharing space and ideological air. So it's it's quite the quite the um, the time of uh, creative uh, ferment, and um, and uh, and this is all before, of course, the, the Holocaust uh, begins and the ghetto is established and his his uh, focus um, becomes primarily tending to his flock um, and wrestling with uh, with faith, what faith could mean in the in the shadows of the Warsaw ghetto. Um, what I wanted to do this evening, as we started this last week, very very briefly, what I wanted to do this evening is. Um, after having uh, given an overview and a contextualization of his historical milieu, of his literary legacy, um, of his biography, um, to jump into uh, some of his um, some of his texts, uh, there were many to choose from, many options to choose from. Here, I decided to start um, at sort of the beginning. Um, the text in front of you. Um, just right comment show of thumb is the is the name of show of still still shared on the screen? It yeah, is. it's shared, it's shared, yeah. Okay, wonderful. So I'm gonna make sure. Mahnava Tova. Exactly, exactly. So this is a this is a printed, uh, this is a sorry, a uh, a digital digitization of the text. My text, my actual hard copy books are in my office where we are no, we're not currently we don't currently have access to very um, this is a text, Benima Shavatova is a pamphlet essentially a contrast that he authored. Um, it wasn't for broad publication, it was meant to be for specific readers. Um, part of the part of his agenda, part of his project for the rejuvenization, uh, the reju rejuvenation, excuse me, and the revitalization of Hasidism, which by this point, right, we're in the 1920s, uh, roughly, um, you know, Hasidism has been around for well over 100 years, um, uh, maybe it's even 170 years, right, for quite a while, and has gone through multiple generations, and there is certainly a sense among some um, that it has um, stagnated, has become stale, has become institutionalized, right, so that instead of being a primarily a spiritual um, um, uh, living force, um, which is affecting the inner lives of its adherents, uh, at this point it, it's, it's for many seen as some a sociological category, right? It's a, it's a way of living, it's a modus vivendi, um, with, you know, um, theological uh, ritual trappings, but not necessarily uh, revolutionizing the inner life um, of its of its adherence. So he comes among as do others during this period to try to um, to rejuvenate, as I say. That's why some call him a neo Hasid. Actually, he's part of the neo Hasidic revolution, um, um, uh, uh, sort of of the likes of Kinnikin of Hillel Zeitland. They probably would have something to talk about. Um, Heshel, by the way, very much Heshel is also in Warsaw um, during this during the 30s during this period. So. You know, he, there's a, you know, the Gary, the Gary Rebbe, I believe, is in Warsaw. Um, there's a lot of interesting things happening in Warsaw around this attempt to rejuvenate Hasidism. So, as part of his agenda here, and here we're, we're going to turn to the text in about just a minute, um, he authors this pamphlet called the Name of Shavatova. The Name of Shavatova, it's been translated to English a couple times, I believe, first as conscious community, that's one way of putting it. Um, and there's another more recent translation whose title eludes me at the moment, but you no, know, you could literally just see the title. B'nai indicates that it's, it's the people who have the capacity or the competence in the following uh, area, and they are um, a group, right? They're a cohort, um, a spiritual fraternity, if you will, a chavraya kadisha, to use the term, the Zoharic terms, which um, which the PSS there, um claims and, and wants to reinstate. It's a group which is, has the capacity, is dedicated to the practice of Machshava Tova. I'm trying to highlight that, I assume that comes across on your screens. The name Machshava Tova, no, people of, of good, um, or perhaps we'd say developed uh, Machshava. Machshava in Hebrew means thought, but as we said last week, and as I'll show you in a few minutes, it doesn't mean thought in the sense of discursive thinking, right, or, or cognizing, um, you know, analytic uh, thinkings or, or ideas. He actually means something along the form of, of awareness, consciousness, and at times he seems to mean machshava in the sense of the capacity to 
uh, to have visualizations, right? To think images and um, and visualizations using one's imagination. It's more the use of imagination uh, to uh, create visualizations and such, and to achieve a, a form of consciousness, less the idea of having specific types of you know discursive discursive thoughts. And by toba, he means something. He talked about this more more, but he means something along the lines of. You know, a developed machshava. So what he's getting at already in the title is his goal is to create a cohort, a fraternity of young Hasidic males um, who are totally dedicated to their discipline. It's kind of a monastic um, imagery, if you will, not because they're isolated from the world, but because of the focus and the rigor right around uh, of a cohort around a given spiritual project. Um, and he uh, wants to bring them together um, to lead them along the spiritual path. So let, let's jump right in. And you'll see here, it says, you know, uh, um, that is, oh, that I'm scrolling down here, but this is basically the criteria for, for the chabra. Um, I'm not going to read that at length right now, but what you'll see here is, here it talks about that the chabra has to be, it's totally, it's an internally egalitarian chevra, meaning all of the people involved, right? They're not, they're not interested in having a leader or follower. It's a group of, of people who are in a fraternity who are joining together um, to around a common around a common goal. Um, um, scroll so long. Um, here he has an odalid. He has a few um, a few of the further criteria. This maybe I'll read a little bit. It's interesting. This shows you. Who is talking to? What his project is about? By the way, I just remind you, of course, that you can either speak up or um, write into the chat box, and I hopefully will see that, and uh, we can we can we can interact that way. As it is, I, I I'm seeing some of your faces, but uh, trying to you know be as interactive as possible. So you see here, he says, here are some of the tanaim, right? Um, and reshit mikol reshit reshit kol. First of all, I'm in shichim lemodazo. Omar, we have to say, we have to give the forewarning, Shirak, Ela, Yuchlu, Lidkari, Vichanis, the Chavra Kadisha. Only the following types of people can enter into our Chavraya Kadisha, our holy fraternity. Aleph, Misha Margish, the Emet, the Kirbo, Kaebi, the Bida Avo, and Al Shrahuk, Rahoku, Meshem. Only someone who truly feels um, a sincere pain at sensing what himself as being distant from God. We're not talking about somebody who knows, right? They sort of intellectually uh, understand their spiritual level, right? Because that's not what he's usually after. He wants somebody who yargish ke'ev leiv. I'm skipping. I'm skipping as we go. Yargish ke'ev leiv al shnafsho marello. He he feels it. He has an emotional sensation of heartache for for this feeling and. I'll just note parenthetically that this focus on hargasha, on feelings, um, is, um, I think I'm not going to spend much time on that tonight, but actually is a major focus of the Rebbe. May that be for another time. Um, the Rebbe um, was, um, um, had a metaphysics of the emotions, first of all, theor theoretically, right? He understood the emotions to be the emotion that, you, that all of you feel, that you and I feel at various times, um, um, enthusiasm, passion, anger, sadness, right, that these are um, not just sort of neural phenomena, but are um, refractions of the spherot, right? the spherot, the divine, um, uh, the, the parts of the, of the, of the Godhead, of, the, of God's, you know, um, inner dynamic life, according to Kabbalistic thinking, and he's an heir to that type of thinking, um, you know, have this sort of dynamism, which are uh, characterized in part by um, by characteristics which we experience are mirrored in our emotions. So the, the, the point is that when you have an emotion, it's not just, you know, a normal thing. It's not just, you know, a phenomenon of the nerves or something like that. It actually is, that's actually part of your mirroring divinity, right? Your enthusiasm, your happiness, your joy, your maybe your anger, your sadness. These are um, you can, these are, these partake of God actually, right? Um, and as such, you can actually use them to connect to God because they are, right? They are, they, they are implicated with, with God's own, um, dynamic, God's own being. Um, and that's really important that he's spoken 
that's on a theoretical level, but on the practical level, he spoke about um, and taught about ways of sensitizing oneself to one's emotions, feeling one's emotions. He says somewhere, we want to make you into a feeling or emotional person. That's what we're trying to do because by able, being able, excuse me, being able to touch, to sense, to experience viscerally, by the way, literally, right, in one's body, one's emotional life, um, one is thereby connected to, connected to God. It's not, it goes beyond a sense of classism as, you know, trying to get people happy and emotional because it has some sort of, you know, effect on them. Um, it can motivate them to, to, I don't know, whatever, whatever the desiderata um, one, one establishes, right? Um, no, it's more, or even just for its own sake, be happy for happiness' sake. And you know, it's more than that. But becoming emotional, becoming aware of one's emotions, one connects with God uh, directly. That's a very important thing. So he says the person who joins this group, therefore, has to be someone who feels within themselves, who feels, right? Actually feels the heartache of being distant, distance, distance from God. He has to be bet a ben Torah. Ima'atim harbe. So this is not somebody who is external from the world of the traditional observance and learning. It's somebody who actually is, builds upon that. He has to be somebody who um, has, uh, who's actually somebody who is uh, um, a, a worker or something like that. He has, a, he has a business, that's fine. But but he has to still show up three times a week to the meeting place and, uh, and dedicate himself to those times, um, um, etc. But Shaloyeh has shakran. He can't be a liar. He has to be straightforward and honest. He, to meet, he wants someone who's totally true. Right? Someone who's, who's inherently a liar, who's so deeply invested in, who's so deeply um, uh, habituated in, in, in some form of deceit, a lie, he'll cheat or lie to others, and also he will lie to himself. Right? So he wants people a certain, a certain character type. What does he want them to do? As follows. So we started this last week. Let's come back to it now. I'm now reading... The goals of the Chavra. Otalaf. Hapasuk mi Aser Tisrael Omer. The verse says, and this is what we did last week. Vatashkach el mechol aleka. The verse in Deuteronomy speaks of uh, the, the tragedy of people forgetting God. Vatashkach el, they forgot God. So he says, Zehu ikar hasiba shemarcheket at Adam min Elohav. This forgetfulness, forgetting. This is also very important. The forgettingness, uh, forgetfulness. Excuse me is the primary reason, the primary sin, if you will, that causes people to distance, them, distance themselves from God. Right? And the opposite of that forgetfulness, and here again, he does not mean forgetting a piece of data. He means something about their consciousness, right? They are not, uh, their thoughts, their inner life is distant from God. So he says, um, the opposite of that would be somebody who has machshava, what we call, what he calls tova in short. He's quoting from Elimelech Olijensk, his forebearer, actually, his ancestor, that the Machshava should be pure and, and clear and strong. What does it mean to have clear and strong Machshava? It doesn't mean that you have strong analytic skills. Right? He means somebody who has strong consciousness, somebody who has strong use of, uh, has trained themselves in the use of the imagination in visualization, so they're in control of their of their of their of their machshavot and can utilize them to experience uh, experience um, um, essentially divinity or experience the divine um, through uh, various through through various various means. And everyone knows that if they would mamash see themselves standing before God, they would have no yitzur hara. The problem is we don't see ourselves that way. We don't see the world that way. Now, he thinks that he claims that the world that we actually see, the physical world, is not an illusion as some, you know, mystics might might claim, right? That here I'm holding a cup like I had last week, right? So they might claim that this cup is an illusion, and actually, um, it's actually, you know, just just uh, just divinity or something along those lines. It's uh, matter, but imbued by a platonic form. Um, no, no, he thinks actually that the physical world does really exist, but in its existence in the as material, it 
um, it is an extension of an, an expression of divinity, right? So this, this is a cup and this cup um, in, in this cup somehow is, is God. Leta tar panur mine, as they say in Kabbalah. There's no place, there's no, nothing which is absent, uh, which God is absent. Um, so someone who actually can see with their very eyes, can learn to see the physical world and physical reality and can experience himself standing in front of God in that moment, partly through the use of his machshavot, so that's somebody who would have no Yetzir Hara, and that is somebody who would have um, remedied this, this, this crisis of forgetfulness, of forgetting God. Here we'll continue to Otbet, but we did not really, I think we did not, no, Ot Gimel, excuse me, I'll skip Otbet, which, um, which we did not get to last week, so my part, we only started, so here we go. So the improvement and strengthening of the machshava. Zehu yusod chavrotenu. That is our primary goal. Our b'nei machshava tova. I'm creating a spiritual cohort of Hasidic elites who will have chizuk machshava. Ikur hamsisha yadad nuchali kasher b'vadav. This is our primary means of attaching ourselves to divine service. Lo b'chinat b'chor hashivcha asher achar harichayim. We'll be able to attach ourselves to divine service this way, not, not like some sort of um, you know, lowly servant who behind the mill sees God, rather from a distance, right, is aware of God, but it's, it's not close, it's not intimate. Now, he wants a life, he wants to have a relationship where it's a much more intimate, it's familial. It's like a son who feels again that 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 that, that term um, that ruta hargashal hargish and margish ruta shalaviv who actually feels and these are not just like rhetorical flourishes he actually actually speaks to the core of his mission here of his his project people who can feel the closeness of one's of one's father God. Um, so if indeed, let's assume that all of us on this call right now um, have been so quickly convinced that the key towards spiritual practice is chizuk machshavas, having become b'nei machshavat about that by training our consciousness and our um, our capacity, our imaginative faculties um, by meditating and visual, visual, visualizing um, specific things. Um, we'll be able to come close to to God, to progress on our spiritual path, to become, in another language, you know, enlightened beings of sorts. So, assuming we become convinced of that, the question is: So, what's so hard about that? You know, what, what actually is so difficult about achieving that? So, he identifies, if he has said, Stern does, two primary um, obstacles, and this is worth paying attention to. He says as follows: One and two, right? I'll have that. So he says one. Here's the first obstacle. He says, first of all, we have a lack of, I'd say, awareness or um, uh, awakeness or maybe arousal, we could say. It's overroot. It's overus. Um, whether it's during those moments of hislavus, of hitlavut, whether it's the moments of passion, of joy as passion, or when it's those moments of shvirat of brokenheartedness. And I think all of us in this call probably have those moments, right? Moments, I hope people have those, at least the moments of, you know, just tremendous joy. And also it's part of the human condition um, that people experience moments of breaking of the heart. So he says, you know, you have, people are often simply, um, um, unaware and unmoved, right? Unaroused, unawakened, they're sleeping through, uh, sleeping through these experiences. Again, experiencing these emotions is so key to him. Because every moment that the Israelite, he calls sometimes the Jew, the Israelites, one of my senior colleagues suggested he calls them Israelites because it sort of harkens, it has a sort of archaic feel to it rather than calling them a Yehud or, or a Yid or something that Yiddish, right? He speaks of the Israelite, right? Back to the biblical legacy, you know, he speaks, and I'll come to that in a moment. That when the, when the, when the Jew, when the Israelite is mitaher, 
it becomes, it's by its nature to become um, excited, passionate, to have enthusiasm, our emotions are triggered. Excuse me, machshavato yoter chazaka. Feels like yoter chazaka he tehora leela mitzure gufo v'dim yonohi. And even with a little bit of hit overhoot, a little bit of this enthusiasm or arousal, um, awaking this, um, that itself already um, lends itself to stronger machshava, to pure machshava during those times, right? So our emotional state has to be cultivated if we're to achieve, uh, become b'nei machshava Torah, toba, right? Like we say, like in Yom Kippur, he says people who, during those moments in Yom Kippur, um, ni'ila or something, whatever moment, uh, when there's this emotional activation, so then he says it's not, then people can imagine themselves, see themselves standing in right, literally in front of God, living in the, in, uh, with God consciousness, living in God's presence, right? But you need that emotional activation to achieve that, right? The problem is that our hearts and minds, right? They're closed up, they're, they're foolish. And we don't actually have the ability because we, to have machshava and those moments which isn't material. So we can only think of things with our, even with our minds, even with our imagination, which are material and, and banal and pedestrian and, you know, of olam hazen. And, uh, and we can't, you, you know, let, 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 let loose and um, make our, let our imaginations become unfettered and, um, and soar and soar above. And that's, that's true, you know, you know, even during, uh, during times of, uh, of apparent joy, you know, it's um, all the more so when you have absolute, right, when one is depressed. Right. Actually, I forget who says this to me, but someone you noted that he, again, he has a sort of, he pays attention to emotions and he says that, you know, atzvut, um, atzvut um, is different than shirat ali, because he mentioned earlier, atzvut, he probably something along the lines of sadness or maybe we'd call depression today, not necessarily clinical depression, but some form of depressive state. Um, and that is kind of for him like a non-emotion. Right. That, 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 that's, that's just sort of the state of being flat and dulled, um, sort of a limp emotional state, right, without any uh, sort of uh, strength to itself. That's different than shirat talev, a broken heartedness. You could have, you can watch a, you can read a sad novel, or hear a beautiful piece of sad music, and you know, and you're you're led to tears. You know, that you certainly couldn't be said in that moment to be not feeling. You're actually feeling very deeply. You're feeling sadness. You're feeling shirat talev. Right? So that's actually a positive in certain respects. Atzvut, depression, which is a lack of feeling, is a flatness, would not be a negative. Um, so he's basically claiming, and I'll move on to the, to the next, uh, the next O tier. He's basically claiming that so far that one of the primary obstacles to achieving spiritual, uh, achieving the goals of the spiritual path, is that we don't have uh, emotional um, um, arousal, emotional awakeness, right? We're actually sleeping through um, that part of our lives. I don't know if this resonates with people on the, on the call, but certainly for myself, um, there are, you know, I definitely can, uh, that definitely does resonate. It's something to be said for this claim that inside of us is a tremendous, um, are tremendous, you know, mountains and peaks and valleys and dips um, and plains of emotional experience that we just don't pay much attention to, right? We sort of live past it somewhere in us, but we're not, we're, our, our, our consciousness is elsewhere. Um, to him, that's a great tragedy. And by not, by, by not paying attention to the, that emotional landscape, we are cutting ourselves off um, from, uh, we're sleeping through life, essentially. We're forgetting, that's why we are, we are forgetting. Second of all, that v'od chisaron yishbo, there's a second, you know, uh, 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 lacking in us. V'hu mumtivi she'in lo b'chla machshva chazaka, and this is natural, which is that we simply don't have strong machshavot. We have not developed and cultivated, we've not exercised that mu the muscle of the imagination. Right? This is like we say, leval seichal katan. For example, if you tell somebody who is of limited mental capacity, let's say you tell them something new. You tell them some new chadash tovar chachma, right? For some, you know, some sort of advanced, you know, um, 
piece of information, some new, whatever, you know, mathematical uh, chidush or something, or whatever it is, some person who doesn't have the intellectual capacity to understand, right, he, his sikhlo katan, he won't understand. And because of this limitation, lo dai shagam b'shatit over root, excuse me, sorry, he says so too, right? Um, just like somebody who, you know, who has limited mental capacity, so someone who hasn't, who has limited imaginative capacity, they've never thought of this. So never, no one's ever taught them to work on their imagination. Right? Who, who ever thought of that as like the goal of the spiritual practice, right? But he says, and that's, that's our primary goal, at least that probably means the spiritual practice, is to develop your ability to imagine and visualize. He says, if you don't do that, lo die, which is totally natural, like in other words, not having that capacity is natural. Lo dai shekam b'shati to root, afshem achshavato metoreret umitchazeket ena chazeka kamosh shichaliyot. Then what's going to happen is not only is it that during times of hito root when he is awakened, it won't be as strong as it should be. Ella shekom achshavato hu rak b'shat hito root levad ve'achok kach shud nader b'menu. But rather, what's going to happen is he's only going to have strong machshava. A strong capacity to to live in God's presence, to 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 have the consciousness consciousness to see God, to be in God's presence. He'll only have that during the times that he is emotionally awakened, and any other time, that's it. Right? He's left to his total pedestrian life. Um, and it's coming to a key line here. So here's a moment to refocus. Clomar. Right? In the positive, someone who is a Baal Machshava Chazaka, someone who has developed their capacity for Machshava, who is B'nei Machshava Tova, who is a Ben Machshava Tova, I should say, Az V'Sha'ah Shemit Arer U'mit Lahev, then during times that he's achieved the emotional states of arousal, awakeness, fiery enthusiasm, Lashem Lahav, then his machshava becomes stronger. Uvara is clear. The ro'eb machshava tov dimyono, dimyon shal Yisrael b'nei nevi'im. This is a huge line. Then at that time, he will see with his imagination, with his thought and imagination, an imagery of Yisrael b'nei nevi'im, the prophetic you have. He will achieve prophecy of some sort. He will see at Hashem Yisbarach v'kisei kibodo. He will behold God. Amazing. The imagination can, uh, when cultivated properly, um, when strengthened by emotional activation, by fire, enthusiasm, by passion, can yield prophecy of a sort. And this claim it's really central, I think, to the PSS. The PSS is trying to create Hasidic prophets. That's why I asked Ray Kellen to call the call the the, type, the series uh, Hasidic prophets, because he's trying to create nothing less than Nibiyim during our times. Now, what does he mean by Nibiyim here? So that's an interesting question. What does he mean by prophets? Does he mean people who can, in Warsaw 1930, tell you what's going to happen in? whatever, Toronto in 2020? No, not necessarily. He doesn't necessarily even mean people who can give political advice or general, whose job it is to give uh, general you know, moralistic, um, you know, chastisements to the people like the Nevi'im did in, in, in the Tanakh. They may do those things. That's not entirely, that's not, that's not, uh, not entirely clear, at least in terms of the, the, the latter activity, the former, I I think he says um, we don't have that capacity any, any, anymore. But what he means is um, prophecy in the sense of um, the ability to um, see, like I said before, to collapse the distinction between the, between the material and the spiritual. To collapse the distinction between the physical, the material, and, and the spiritual. To see in the, in the material uh, and hearing therein um, divinity. Um, that, that is what I think he means. Uh, by creating Nivim in the fundamental sense, as a derivative thereof, perhaps, as a derivative of, of, of that, 
um, he, he would say perhaps that they um, have these other capacities um, of, uh, at least in the days of old, of, of telling the future and things like that. But fundamentally, um, that, that fundamentally, it is a, an ability to, to experience um, God's presence quite, quite, quite literally. So what he wants to do, therefore, is to, and because of these, these are the two things which, obstacles, which uh, block somebody from experiencing Masha Tava, he, of course, wants to remedy them, right, and to cultivate it, lahavud, to cultivate it, overrood, to cultivate it, as he drops shoot, emotionality, to, um, to systematically and um, um, uh, deliberately strengthen People's machshava, their meditation, meditative capacities, or their visualization capacities, their imaginative faculty, and this this is his project for this um, for this group. Now, th this is an enormously ambitious project, right? Creating this cohort, um, and um, requires tremendous, you know, resources of energy. He goes on in other texts to talk about, or other moments in the text, and other texts to talk about um, the economic factors that go into this is to say you have to be able to sustain um, a group of spiritual elites here. Here, I guess he talks about uh, people who are Baale, uh, who are workers, and they have uh, the professionals, but they are dedicated to this as well. Um, he talks in other places of the need to really have communal funds dedicated to um, supporting these Hasidic elites if we're ever going to have a real rejuvenation of, of Hasidism. So if you're familiar with the, with the institutions of, of Kest, of, of Essentag, um, he says that we need to reinstate the practice of basically feeding uh, yeshiva students or kolel students, right? these Hasidic avrechim, um, so that they can be fully dedicated um, to their practice. Uh, their practice has become undervalued so that people no longer want to support you know, their son-in-law or some member of the community. To pursue these things, but he thinks that that's actually critical. They need that space to um, to practice and to cultivate if they're ever going to act as a as a spiry nucleus, this warm nucleus um, from which will emerge um, a a um, spark and a rejuvenation classism at large. Okay, I think this is a good time, given our talking about prophecy. He goes on here, of course, to, to, at length, but I want to see if I can share with you piece of different text for the final few minutes of our time together tonight, um, and that is from Mevoa Sha'arim. So let me see if I can stop share and then restart. Give me one moment. Um, I'm going to try to, to share. Here we go. Okay. Did that work, Ray Kelman? Is there a new, th new document? Great. Okay. That works, works. Wonderful. Okay. Just making sure. Thank you. So this is a... Um, the, from a text called Mevoha Sha'arim. This is the third of his educational works. But I wanted to talk about prophets. I wanted to spend a couple of minutes uh, with this text. Um, this is a text that I that I worked on heavily uh, over the past past few years. Um, and um, it's called Mevoha Sha'arim, as I say, which could be, could be translated as, um, you know, uh, something along the lines of like the introduction. At the entrance, but literally means the entrance to the gates. And I like to think that he means something about that. He's, he's indicating this is an entrance into the gates of classism. So he says here as follows. I'll start from here. He says, this is the book. He actually calls it, interestingly, this is the book, Chovat Avrichim. Sefer Chovat Avrichim. This is the book which is um, the, about the, the obligations of the advanced chassid, the Avrich. His first book, which is called Chovat Hamidim, which is more well known, was geared for younger students. This is meant to be the you know, opening of the third book, and he begins it with an introduction called Entrance, Entrance to the Gates. Right? And this is the third, he says here, of the series of Chalat HaTamidim and Hashanah HaTamidim, two other works I mentioned last week, and only one who's read those may read this book. Right? So he, I know you guys haven't necessarily done that, but you see that his, he clearly sees this as a series, a trilogy that you're meant to work through. Uh, with one to the second to the third, and you get to Mevo HaSharim, it's signed by Colonimus Kalmish, the diminutive of Kalman, um, um, son of the Holy Rabbi, Rev. Eli Melech of Grzynsk, that was his father who passed away when he was quite young, Av Beisdin, Av Beidin of Piasechna. 
right? The head of the Beit Din of PSS Nanak. In the manuscript, I believe, um, you see that those words, um, um, Av Beit Din, were crossed out, right? Probably when he was editing the work, when he was already in Warsaw and PSS No, I guess, was, uh, was, was destroyed or had been, um, you know, everyone had, everyone had left already. Okay, so he says as follows. I'm just going to read some, some citations, or some selections here. Um, again, please feel free to comment in the chat, answer any chats yet, or ask any questions. But um, I'll give you some of, the, some of the highlights at the beginning here. So he says, you know what we learned in the Talmud and Megillah, I'll read you my translation. Tanya Rabbana, the rabbis taught that there were 48 prophets and seven prophetesses who prophesied to Israel, and none of them added or detracted from the Torah, right? Um, except for Mikra Megillah, it's a separate, separate point. But basically, they didn't add or detract um, from, 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 the, from the Torah. Um, the truth is there are many more prophets, right? But, uh, but they, only the prophecies which are necessary for all generations were included and canonized in the Tanakh. The rest were, were lost to history. So he asked a basic question, which is, you know, what is the point of these prophets? If they're not going to add or detract from Torah, if they're not going to leave some sort of fun, they're not going to do um, uh, comment on um, or fundamentally um, uh, alter the corpus of Torah, then why did we really need them, he says? Right, what, what do we really need them for? So Rashi talks about they're needed to teach repentance or other things. They needed to give Horah. Again, but he said, what does Horah actually mean, though? I mean, they're not adding to the Torah. They're not detracting from the Torah. Are they just giving halacha psakim? That, that's what, what any chacham can do, right? What are they really doing here? So he says, and I want to I want to share the following lines. He goes, this is quite a discursive text. It goes on for quite a while, but I want to just give you a highlight. He says as follows. Let me just scroll down. He says, look, it's true that to our distress. We have neither prophet nor seer nowadays, right? We have no more real prophecy in the sense of telling the future anymore. Here he's, he's borrowing this from the, he's learning this or deriving this from the Gemara and Sota. He says, and therefore we know only a little bit of what, you know, what these, what these prophets really were. But here, and here's a key line. I think we're gonna probably end uh, with this type of, this line or this passage or a few passages. But of the essence of the prophet and his Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh, right? We know, we know nothing. We don't know anything about them. And therefore, because we don't really know that the essence of the prophet, we make the following mistake. We perceive him, the prophet, only in accordance with our needs. That is to say, as somebody who tells the future, a portender, right? Or someone who devises militarily, like, all, like the prophets did, you know, in Tanakh, but you know, Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah. He says, but the problem, the thing is that even in the yesteryear, during the times of the prophets, people saw them as pillars of fire. That's to say, they understood them to be, let me find you now, scroll down again to the, to the, to the real line. Yeah, here we go. He says, here's the thing. Well, we've, here's the thing I need to teach you, he says to the reader, and that which we've lost sight of. The term prophet does not describe the essence of the prophet, but merely that God has spoken with him, right? Navi Milashon articulation, right, to speak. Um, so they're called prophets because they tell the future. That's true. But more fundamentally, right, they are something else entirely. Fundamentally, the prophet is somebody who is a certain type of person, right? He said who has, who has an essence, but their essence is somebody who's achieved, um, here we go, an, an ungraspable spiritual essence of which we perceive only as actions. So the point he's making here, and I'll illustrate it in a moment with, a, with an analogy, is that, you know, we, we mistake the prophets for the prophet's activities, right? We think that since a prophet told the future, Portending, it should portend and such. That's what defines the prophet. Right? So that, that's a that's a big mistake, right? There is a difference between what someone something is inherently and what they do. For example, he says his grandfather, the Magad of Kushnets, I'm reading, I'm highlighting again page one thirty-seven in my translation. 
Please move this window away from the share. Right. Um, he says, regarding my father and Magad, my grandfather Magad of Kajnitz, may the memory of the righteous be a blessing. He says, you know, the essence of who the Magad of Kajnitz was is impossible to describe with words. Everybody knows that he, you know, knew much Torah and that he was a righteous person, etc. That's true. But the essence of who he was was not someone who knew a lot of Torah, was not somebody who was righteous. Those were things about him, right? But he himself was a certain type of person, which he doesn't really articulate what that person was. He thinks it's, you, know, you couldn't actually can't, couldn't actually articulate that. And the point is therefore that, and here I quote, when we speak of the prophet and prophecy, we speak of a type of greatness in hearing the essence of the worshiper, of the obeyed, it indescribable, attainable only upon performing the avoda of prophecy. I think I'll end with, uh, with this line. Says the says the says the PSS there. Avod nivua, excuse me, is a form of avoda, and he's not the first one to say this, but it's important to articulate this tonight. Prophecy is a form of it's a spiritual practice. It's a spiritual, um, it's a rung on the spiritual ladder. Chassid parlance avoda is a form of you know spiritual practice of, of worship. So the there's an avoda. There's a type of spiritual practice of what we call of the pro, of the prophetic type, which doesn't mean telling the future. And that could be a derivative of that activity, but it's about becoming a type of person. It's about becoming a person of a certain spiritual stature. And therefore, what he's trying to create in his B'nai Machshavatova is a group of people, a cohort, which has achieved that status. Right? Who practice the avoda, who practice the avoda of prophecy not that they tell the future but they are trying but they are heirs to the spiritual practice of the Nibiyim. and so Hasidim, Hasidism at its core he thinks is a is heir to the prophetic line as transmitted through Chazal and the Kabbalists developed through each through each group and each epoch and ultimately culminating in Hasidism and again this type of avoda is an avoda which is very much dependent upon development and cultivation of emotions, experience of emotions, um, and visualizations, imaginations of developing a machshava tova, a strong imaginative um, um, uh, faculty, um, becoming strong of consciousness. So you, I, I hope that you can have seen, our, seen already or appreciate already with this, this a very brief overview of parts of his teachings, um, why he might have, been, might have attracted so much attention over these years lately, um, and why I think he held, uh, you know, much uh, much power um, over over contemporary uh, practitioners and, and readers readers alike. You have a person speaking in the 1920s, 1930s, in the midst of, you know, uh, interbellum Poland, who speaks of the need to cultivate emotional intelligence, if you will, emotional awareness um, of the of the need to um, focus not only on external practices and behaviors and uh, norms, which he was absolutely a normative, you know, uh, a normative orthodox figure. Um, but we have a person who shifts the focus or maybe highlights how Hasidism shifts the focus inwards um, and um, um, dedicates itself to the cultivation of the inner life, of the life of the imagination, a life of visualization, a life of spiritual practices, meditation, of song, of enthusiasm and of passion, um, and these things are part of the path of the uh, which lead one to the practice, the rungs of the prophets. Let me pause for a moment. I'm seeing some chats come in. What do we What do we have here? So Chaim Besson writes, "Did he succeed in creating this group? Did they produce any famous works or rebellion? Um I think he had some Tal some Talmudim, but I don't know if we know if he, you know, how much how active this group actually was. Um, and no, I don't know that they produced any various works or obey him. I mean, remember that the whole project was interrupted by the Shoah, right? So as he's actually editing the work that we just, that we, that we just read, um, as we just read, he, um, he, um, is living in the Warsaw ghetto and has his family killed, his students killed, right? Um, I forget, uh, yeah, I mean, this total decimation, 
say the least of his world. So um, um, maybe now, some, some students did, did survive, but uh, I don't think very many. And um, yeah. Uh, Brad Kilman asks, how does he compare to Rabbi Saul Salanter? So there are those who, who thought, you know, I think especially Dan Reiser, Rabbi Kilman, if you're interested, Dan Reiser has written about um, in a chapter in one of his books is about, um, you know, visualization techniques in the Musser movement. Um, I think in terms of the focus on, on Musar, um, on the need to have, you know, F, um, um, strong ethical traits, but also um, to train oneself in Midot more generally, so he talks about that as well in the beginnings of his works. But, you know, I'm not an expert of Marcel Salanter. I will say that he, that Peter Sessor is explicit that, you know, those first steps of first, you know, um, removing, imagine like the one spiritual life as, as a room. So first Im Im removing, you know, debris and cleaning up the room and then actually beautifying the inner room. These are all necessary prerequisites and preludes to progressing on the spiritual path, but they're not the end of it. So I don't know what your social answer might say about that, but a few sessions certainly takes it further. Okay, so we've done these two, these two brief sessions uh, with you all is again, and then I'll close is he, we introduced, introduced you uh, to the, the world, the milieu of the P.S. Essner, um, in terms of Hasism, in terms of interbellum Poland, uh, introduced you to his literary legacy and to his, um, his spiritual incredibly, um, um, ambitious project. And tonight, I, I hope that you have, um, you know, appreciated uh, joining me as we delved into just some of his texts, one from the 1920s and one from some point during the 1930s. Um, I don't think we know exactly when he, when he, when he composed all of his, all his works. Um, and I uh, hope you can sense his, um, his spiritual passion and some of the features of his legacy that have attracted such attention. Okay, so thank, thank you. you very much.